Good afternoon to everybody or good morning to our colleagues uh, over the Atlantic Ocean. On behalf of Österreich Nationalbank, let me express a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining our online seminar today. My name is Julia Wirth. I'm the head of the analysis unit covering Central, Eastern and Southeastern European economies in the Austrian Central Bank. And today we will listen to the presentation of the World Bank Global Economic Toolbacks Report. The report was released last week and is titled Pandemic, Recession, the Global Economy in Crisis. It presents the current global outlook by the World Bank and provides an overview of the regional macroeconomic implications of COVID-19. As we have an explicit focus on Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe here in the Austrian Central Bank, this is of emerging Europe is of course in particular of interest to us. And we are very fortunate to have the lead author and her team today with us, uh, Francisca Unsorge, Colette Wheeler, and uh, Justin, uh, Justin Damien uh, Binet. A very warm welcome to you. Uh, I may briefly introduce Francisca, and she will introduce her colleagues then. Um, so Francisca Unsorge is the lead economist in the World Bank's Development Economics Vice Presidency, Presidency and manager of the Development Prospects Group in the World Bank. Prior to joining the World Bank, she worked at the International Monetary Fund, covering a range of Asian, European, and Central Asian economies. And before that, she was in the office of the Chief Economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And I'm very glad to say with all these institutions, we have very good relationships here in the Austrian Central Bank. Francisca holds a PhD in economics from the University of Toronto, and has published on a variety of topics in academic and policy publications, covering topics uh, related to fiscal financial sector policy, savings and consumption, capital flows, trade and commodity related issues in emerging markets and developing economies. So Francisca will give us a 30 minute presentation. And after that, we have time for questions and answers. Before we start, let me mention some organizational issues. So everyone, please keep your microphones muted and your cameras deactivated. Everything is already set in this mode. And please post your questions in the chat window only. Make sure you send your questions to all participants. My colleague Martin Feldkircher and me, we will get back to your questions after the presentation and pass them on to Francisca and her team. So we will collect all your questions and then make sure that they are being answered also by uh, Francisca and her colleagues. Uh, let me also point out that we are recording this event and that the video will be available on our website, website in a couple of days. So thank you very much for your cooperation and Francisca, the floor is yours. Thank you. I always have to check, can you hear me? You can hear me? Okay. Okay. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you across the Atlantic. It's still a pleasure <laughs> here and see you all. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Julia. I, let me introduce my two colleagues. That is one advantage of doing this online. It's unconstrained by travel costs. So I'm very pleased to be joined by Colette Wheeler who covers the uh, ECA region, what we call the ECA region, Europe and Central Asia in the World Bank in our unit. And I believe there are a couple of colleagues also from the Vienna office on this call. So it's a pleasure to have Colette on the call as well. She knows in our unit the most about the region. Also joining us is J.D. Gannett. He's ex-Bank of Canada, and he's uh, covering in our group the global economy. So he knows everything about global trade, global finance, global commodity markets, everything global. He's not region specific, but everything global. So I'm very glad to have JD on this call as well. So yes, to come back to our deck, this one, this is the edition. And for those of you who know it, there is a, usually a subtitle. So the subtitle that you mentioned, Eula, is actually the chapter one title. This one, what has happened in the last three months has literally left us speechless. We don't have a subtitle. <laughs> and let me show you why. Let me just share my presentation. There we go. And now you should see it, I hope, right? 
Okay, so this this edition is all about COVID-19. What has COVID-19 done to the global economy, and especially to emerging markets and developing economies? So there's the global outlook, the regional outlooks, and then a number of analytical pieces, all centered around the impact, the short-term and long-term and regional impact of COVID-19. So I structure my remarks today around four questions. First, what are the, uh, the global growth prospects in the near term? What do we expect for 2020 and 2021? Um, so the outlook is bleak there, but perhaps cheap oil is a, a, a ray of hope. Turns out not so much. So this, number one and two are all about the short-term implications. Number three is about the long-term implications of COVID-19. If we look back at past recessions, they've all done long-term damage. So if history is any guide, this one will also do long-term damage. And then very briefly, we'll go back to the policy priorities. So let's start with the short-term outlook. Now, I'm not showing you the infection curve because you see that every day in the newspapers. And the world has seen pandemics before. So if you think back, the last really, really global pandemic that globally killed 20 million people compared to our 400,000 now, the last global pandemic was in 1918. What the world has not seen, for as long as we have data, is this kind of policy response. And the chart on the left shows you that. Almost 100% of GDP, of global GDP, have shut down economic activity, deliberately shut down economic activity in various aspects. So almost 100% of global GDP have shut down schools at some point in the last two, three months. Two-thirds of global GDP, advanced economies and EMDs, have shut down workplaces in the last three months. Almost 100% have shut down and are still shutting down large events. And here, the international uh, travel restrictions look low because we are taking very restrictive uh, um, definition. We are just looking at the countries, counting the countries that are, have really shut down broad-based, have impl impl implemented broad-based restrictions. If you are a little less stringent in your requirements, 99% of global GDP have put in place some sort of international travel restriction. It's really extraordinary how in the last three months, governments deliberately shut down economic activity. And it's not just governments, it's people who've responded. Either they've responded to governments or they've responded to the pandemic. And you see that on the right in these Google mobility trackers. So that's taking May already. May, February is our bench line, benchmark. Not much has happened by February, but by May, you see how much mobility around the usual places that people go to has collapsed. So mobility around transit and retail has fallen by half to two thirds, both in emerging markets and in advanced economies. Uh, mobility around workplaces has fallen by a third. The only thing people seem to be still doing is grocery shopping. Everything else has essentially shut down. This is an extraordinary change in people's behavior, and consumers' behavior, and companies' behavior. And of course, the global economy has responded. It's responded in a truly extraordinary way, too. <laughs> in every respect that we've looked at, this recession has already beaten records, records in all the data that we can find. So for example, take goods trade on the left. In April, we saw the steepest one month fall in new export orders. The global composite PMI reached an absolutely astonishing 26 points in April. It's come back a little bit since then, but it's still at 36. No, it's still deep, deep, deep into contraction. Now that's goods, uh, a proxy for goods trade. Then look at the proxy for services trade, tourist arrivals. In March, they have collapsed by two thirds. And that's only March, because we don't have much data for April yet. If you look at April data, tourist arrivals have essentially collapsed by more than 90%, 98% on average for the few countries that do report. Tourism is shut down. Then look at financial markets. If you remember, if you think back to the first three weeks of April, it looked like we were on the brink of a financial crisis. Every one of these first three weeks of April had the largest capital outflows from EMDEs on record. And oil prices, commodity markets also were completely disrupted. All sorts of spreads were opening in April. So on, in March, it was the single largest, steepest one-month decline in oil prices. And in April, they reached a complete trough with WTI even going into negative terrain. We'll go back to that. So since then, conditions have calmed, not on the real side, not so much on the trade and tourist side, 
but definitely on the financial side and the commodity market side. The financial capital uh, outflows have stopped. We see some capital inflows and some ENVs. And oil prices have come back, have rebounded a bit. So they're now back to half the January level. And we'll come back to that. So like, there has been some easing since the dog days of the global recession in, in sometime in mid-April. And that, a lot of the credit for that really goes to central banks and governments in advanced economies. It's extraordinary what they have put in place to just buffer the size of the economic shock. So you see here the stimulus, the, 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 some of the measures, subset of the measures that the advanced economy central banks have put in place, including the ECB. All of them have flashed interest rates. A lot of them have put in place uh, loan programs, lending some sort of loan support or outright lending programs. All of them have put, uh, many of them have put in place unconventional asset purchases or some sort of balance sheet expansion. And that goes, that has gone beyond what has been done in the global financial crisis. And it's not just central banks, it's also governments that have done a lot. As you see in the chart on the right here, you can see the, the, the red bars are the narrow fiscal stimulus type measures and the blue bars are the loan guarantees that may or may not turn into actual stimulus depending on whether they're, they're used or not. But you can see that for all the major advanced economies, the fiscal stimulus that have been put in place in March, April, essentially, or March, April, May, in the last three months in t alone, has, been, has dwarfed what was put in place in the global financial crisis. So the, it's, it's somewhere on the order of double to eightfold the stimulus that was put in place in the global financial crisis. So there is one lesson that advanced economies, and actually a lot of EMBEs also seem to have learned from 2009. If you put in place stimulus very quickly and on a large scale, you can prevent worse out outcomes. And governments and central banks have done this just like it was needed in this time, in this global recession. Now still, the numbers look atrocious, and without an anchor, they're hard to understand. And I'll give you the anchor in the next slide, but let's just go through the, the uh, numbers first. So for 2020, we expect the global economy to contract by 5.2%. Especially advanced economies will contract by 7%. It looks bigger than END contraction, but on the other hand, advanced economies have lower potential growth to begin with. The revisions, the downward revisions are severe in both advanced economies and END. What stands out in these forecasts for 2020 is actually the ENDE number. So we've put, put together data since 1960 for a large set of, a largest possible group of countries. And ENDE, for the ENDEs, this outright contraction in output is the first on record. ENDEs do not contract. That's not what they do. They have potential growth on the order of 4 to 5%. They don't contract. 2020 is the first time in 60 years for as long as our data goes back, possibly longer, that ENDEs are expected to have an outright income contraction, GDP contraction. And that is broadly in line with consensus. Our 2020 forecasts are not that far off con consensus. What is a little bit lower than consensus are our 2021 forecasts. We expect a rebound, obviously, every global recession followed by a rebound. But at the global level, the rebound in 2020 is not even enough to offset the output losses we have in 2020. There is a little bit of a, a stronger rebound in advanced economies because they seem to be bringing the pandemic under control now. We can actually expect a recovery. In EMDEs, everything seems to be postponed a bit. So there are still a lot of large EMDEs, India, Brazil, where the pandemic has not obviously been brought under control. So we expect a delayed recovery in EMDEs. Now, Every single EMDE region except for East Asia and uh, Pacific, EAT, is expected to contract and contract by either the largest or the second largest contraction for as long as our data goes back. The, especially Latin America and the Caribbean will be heavily hit because they have so many commodity exporters and tourism reliant countries. The one exception is East Asia, and that is only an exception because of China. It's kind of a hedge of everyone else. So for China, we still expect growth of 1% which for China is extraordinary. China for decades has grown by 6% or more. For China to grow at 1% is a massive global growth shock. So for China, we do still expect 1% growth in 2020. We expect them to be able to 
prevent a major tectonic wave. I mean, they, they seem to be really uh, uh, um, containing now, taking harsh measures immediately to contain any new outbreak. And then we see a sharp out, uh, rebound in 2021. Um, so these numbers, they're just numbers until you see them in context. Oh, I wish I had to make this bar here red now. This here, 2020 on the left, that is our current global uh, global recession, and if you so we put together data for the globe for as many countries as we can possibly find for per capita GDP since 1870, so 150 years of data, and since 1870 there have been 14 global recessions. Now the last one that was really bad, that was worse than the one we're currently seeing, is actually 1945-1946. That's the last global recession that is larger than the one we're currently having. So this current global recession is actually the worst that any of us on this call will remember. Maybe our parents rem or grandparents remember the 1945-46 one. None of us have seen anything like what is happening now. The per capita GDP growth contraction is extraordinary. Not only is, it, is the, the depth of the recession extraordinary, the breadth cross-country breadth is also extraordinary. And that's what's shown in the chart on the right here. But you can see the share of economies that are going to see or that have seen per capita income contraction, outright losses, per capita income losses. And you can see that more than 90% of economies in 2020 are going to see outright per capita income losses. That hasn't happened since 1870 in 150, 150 years. The last episode that goes anywhere close to this is actually the uh, Great Depression in the 30s. Never before have we seen more than 90% of economies facing outright income loss. And things could get worse. We, we are fairly certain that this is the worst global recession since the Second World War. What we're not so certain is how deep, exactly how deep it will be. One can easily imagine a worse scenario. So uh, our baseline scenario assumes three things. Well, actually, um, let me step back. Let me actually go through these risks here of the, the downside risks. I clearly said the downside. You've seen this particular list many times in various formulations of it. But this time is somewhat different in that all the risks are anchored in the pandemic. If the pandemic is not brought under control, then any one of these risks in the usual list may materialize. So if the pandemic is not brought under control in the major economies, you may see new lockdowns. If you have new lockdowns, you shut down travel and transport. If you shut down travel and transport, you see oil prices collapsing. If oil prices collapse, oil exporters will suffer. What will also happen is that commodity prices fall, and the commodity exporters will suffer, which is actually a large group of countries. If you have lockdowns again, you'll have more bankruptcy. It's not, it's, it's, with every month of lockdown, it becomes more difficult for companies to survive. So you'll have, might have widespread bankruptcy, so suddenly, the bank balance sheets that for now still seem okay may really come under pressure. We've really got a broad base, longer, more extended uh, set of real sector distress. So then you might actually end up with a financial crisis that looked so close in early March. So we have three scenarios, and we, we wanted to quantify a little bit this risk that things go wrong. We do that here in our three scenarios. So our baseline scenario assumes three months of lockdown. And then a relaxation that is not so much that you get a second wave. Yeah, so there, there is a lock, there is a relaxation, but you know, not such that we actually get a second wave. So no second wave. That's the assumption one. Assumption two is that there's no financial crisis. So what central banks have done, they continue doing. They just avert financial crisis over and over whenever there's pressure. And the third assumption is that eventually, once the economy is open up, there will actually be these this huge stimulus that's in the world, both on the monetary and the fiscal side, is going to gain traction. But in each of these three dimensions, things can go terribly wrong. So you could have more lockdowns, another three months in our downside scenario. Yeah, the bottom part of all these bars here, that's our downside scenario. You could have a financial crisis. If there's another three months of lockdowns, you could have widespread bankruptcies, financial crisis. And if the lockdown happens, another three months, this, this policy stimulus cannot gain traction. If people can't go out and shop, they can't go out and shop. There, there's very little room for policy stimulus to gain traction. So in that event, the global 
contraction, the global the contraction global economy may be eight percent instead of five percent in our baseline scenario. The recovery would not be much better because everything would be pushed out by at least a quarter. So there'll still be a sluggish recovery, but we'd make up even less of the output losses of 2020. On the other hand, of course, things might be just fine, just like we expect this sort of around April when all of this sort of surprise, no, it was hard to imagine how bad it could become. So maybe things will just rebound. Maybe maybe there will be very few disruptions and, and stimulus is massive and will actually really gain traction very quickly, much faster than we think. So maybe global growth, the global economy, instead of contracting by 5%, will contract by 4%. But even that, even our upside scenario, would still feature the largest global recession in 2020 since the Second World War. So even if everything goes right, this is a savage global recession. And it's not just us who are very uncertain about our forecast. It's everyone else too, and I'm sure you as well, no, at the ECB. But here is a measure, a way of measuring this. So this is the consensus. These are the consensus forecasts. We take them back as far as we can and aggregate up. The, the range of consensus forecast for every country and aggregate it up into a global growth forecast. The last time you had, the, well, the previous last time that you had record high uncertainty was actually around the global financial crisis. And even there, when it struck in September, October, no one could imagine an outright contraction. It's only around November, December that people started imagining an outright contraction. But even compared to a global financial crisis, the forecast uncertainty in April and May is just dwarfed the uncertainty in the global financial crisis. This, at this point, we've all lost our anchor. It's impossible to, 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 to give, have any certainty around our specific point forecast. That's why everyone's doing these scenarios. It's huge forecast uncertainty. Now, will cheap oil help? There must be one ray of hope in this bleak scenario. No? Oil prices have collapsed and oil is a major input to global production. Surely that has to you know, give some boost. The problem there is it's, <laughs> it's the wrong kind of production that is boosted by oil, or that, that boosts oil. So uh, first let me just show you the disruption to financial, to, to global oil markets. So in March, you've seen this chart already with the single largest one month decline in oil prices, for as long as we have data, since 1970. And there were multiple factors that affected global oil prices. So one was a complete collapse in global oil demand. If you think back to that restrictions chart, the first one, very first one I showed you where most of the global economy is shut down, this is all, a lot of the shutdowns are actually about travel and transport. Two thirds of global oil demand are travel and transport. You shut that down, you shut down global oil, dem oil demand. You, you shave off two thirds of it. The massive demand shock in, April, in March, April, even into May. But also, we will all remember in, in March, early March, that this agreement between Russia and the OPEC uh, countries fell apart, and the, the, there was no longer any uh, any agreement to cut production. In fact, what happened is then after that, Saudi Arabia and OPEC countries increased their output. So there was also a supply side element to the uh, oil price shock. Now, later on, they agreed, they put in place an even broader group, more oil, price, oil production cuts. But it took a while. It took about a month, more than a month. So we try to disentangle. Oh, first, let me show you, in the, 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 illustrate to you the severity of the contraction in global oil demand. So the EIA expects a contraction in oil demand of almost 20%. Unprecedented. Oil demand is a bit like EMBE growth. It's the kind of thing that never contracts. This one, in, in the second quarter of uh, 2020, there was that almost a 20% collapse in global oil demand. And that follows on another quarter of the contraction in global oil demand. So it's, it's just unprecedented what's happened to global oil demand and global oil market. But in the next step, then, we try to disentangle the source of the oil, this record oil price uh, collapse that you see in the chart on the left. And we do that in a very standard uh, vector autoregression. No, we sign restrictions, so you define demand and you define supply by the responses they're supposed to generate. And here in the second column in the chart on the right, you see the decomposition that that yields. The oil price collapse in the six months ending in April 2020 
we could use March as well, same results. The oil price collapse in those six months was two thirds driven by demand, by the bar, by the center chart actually. The collapse, the global, complete collapse in global oil demand. Okay. So, um, and that makes all the difference. Let me very quickly look at, I'll show you this. We do, we show here what the impact is of past oil price collapses, depending on uh, whether these were supply driven or demand driven oil price collapses. And it turns out that the initial impact is very similar, as you see here in the T column, but demand driven oil price collapses have had no legs in the past. There were no significant output losses over the longer term to EMDE output. So going forward, this means if this one is largely demand driven oil price collapse, it's very likely that we don't see a big rebound in global, uh, global output simply because oil prices are low. All that will happen is global output re will recover and oil prices will recover. Now, these were the short-term implications. Let me move to the long-term implications. We all know from the literature on financial crisis that really what's going in the, after 2008 and 2009, we all know that financial crises do long-term damage. We also know that recessions do long-term damage, and we do that here again. So we show, uh, we estimate in the local projections model, what are the implications of recessions or financial crises, Laven Valencia type financial crisis, on potential output. Others have estimated actual output. We use potential output to remove the zigzag that is an actual output. And we estimate that five years after a recession, an outright output contraction, Output, potential output is still 6% below baseline. Not all financial crises come with recession, so a financial crisis has some, somewhat slower, lower output losses. But if a financial crisis comes with a recession, as you see here in the chart on the right, you get even more severe long-term output losses. So five years after the global recession, you see that potential output is 8% lower than baseline. These, are long, these do long-term damage. Now, many say, but this is an epidemic, it's different, no? In some sense, every recession is different. But we do, we can actually look back at some of the epidemics that happened. We don't, we can't look back to the last global pandemic. We don't have data to 1918. But we can look at investment in labor productivity in the past 20 years of epidemics. And here you see that in these past four epidemics, SARS, MERS, Ebola, and Zika, investment is 11% lower five years after the epidemic in affected countries. And labor productivity was 6% lower, as you see in the chart on the right, five years after the epidemic. These epidemics leave lasting damage, and so do recessions, and this one is a double whammy. And if anything, I skipped the policy section, but I do want to spend some time on this. If anything, we expect the current pandemic to, have, to do even more lasting damage than previous epidemics. So the, there are three reasons for that. First, this is, a, a, this is a global pandemic. No, it's hard to see the world opening up again until it's been brought under control in all the major economies. So restrictions will stay in place until it, there is a non-economic solution found to the problem, no health solution. The other reason, the second reason, is that the world is facing this pandemic in a weak position. As it is, we've, we've come out of a decade, we've just behind, got behind us, a decade of growth disappointment. 2019 saw the lowest uh, post-crisis growth. 2019 saw record high debt. So we've got a decade of slowing potential growth behind it, and we are expecting it to slow further simply for demographic reasons and the normalization in investment. So as it is, this pandemic comes on top of a weak decade that is expected to persist. And third, this pandemic is chipping away at the engines of long-term growth. So look at the kids in school here. So 90%, the orange line in the chart on the right, 90% of the world's children have had their schooling disrupted. We know from the Ebola crisis that when schooling is disrupted, school dropout rates rise. We also know that when there are massive income losses, like are happening now, dropout rates rise. The lasting income losses, there's a whole generation of children who's had their, demo, their, their schooling disrupted and whose parents are facing severe income losses. This is chipping away at human capital accumulation. On top of it, is, there's a risk that it chips away at global value chain and at tourism over the medium term. And both of these have been a source of productivity and income growth. 
in a lot of END. So let me skip the policy priorities. I want to just point you to one more thing, the recovery. Let, let's look forward, not just backwards. <laughs> and not quite so far into the future. After every global recession, there's a discussion about the shape of the recovery. You may remember the global financial crisis. And it's always the alphabet soup. There's a U and a V and the W and the L and this time the bathtubs and the Nike sign. So the only thing we can rule out is the Nike sign because we can't go back in time. But this depends entirely on your assumptions. In growth rate, almost every global recession is a V. In terms of post-crisis, pre-crisis trend, every recession, almost every recession is a bathtub. And if you put it in, in, in terms of pre-recession output levels, not trends, you get any number of shapes, V, W, U, L. So the same recession can be a V, a U, a bathtub, a W, L, just depending on arbitrary technical assumptions. To us, this is not that fruitful a discussion. What we want to emphasize is that all these past recessions have done lasting damage. There's very little reason, if any, to believe that this one is going to be any better than the previous one. So we expect it to take many years before the global economy truly recovers from this global recession and the pandemic. So uh, just a bit of advertising. This one is the June Jeff. We'll also bring out the January Jeff, and it'll be interesting to look back how the recovery proceeds. So uh, since a lot of ECA countries are commodity exporters, this may be relevant that we have our commodity markets outlook that looks in much more depth at uh, commodity market development. And of course, we have our high frequency um, global monitoring product, the Global Monthly. And the two books we spoke about in January already, for those of you who were there. So with that, I look forward to your questions and comments. My, if my colleagues and I will be very happy to answer. There are also many topics that we didn't get to cover in these 30 minutes. So I'm very happy to go into those or any other questions you may have. Thank you. Over to you, Julia. Thank you very much, uh, Francisca, for this very insightful presentation. And uh, um, I think everyone now can't wait to read the report, <laughs> as it contains so much detail and also very uh, carefully done analysis. Um, we thought that we would meanwhile collect quite a few questions through the chat function. This has not happened, so I kindly ask people who have questions, please write them down in the chat function and so that we can then um, uh, post them to Francisca. And um, meanwhile, while you think of any questions or uh, more information that you would like to get out from the team, uh, the World Bank team in Washington, um, maybe I can start with a question. Um, I wanted to ask you that as, at the moment, what we see is currently an acceleration of the pandemic, mostly in developing economies, uh, India, Africa, also Latin America. So given these recent developments, is the, the, uh, are the projections in your report still valid or do you already see a materialization of the downward um, risks that you have mentioned in your report? So to what extent um, can we still um, rely on the figures that you just presented? And uh, maybe a second question, um, since we are uh, always much interested in the Central Eastern and Southeastern European economies, um, in previous, in the in the last big crisis, the 2009 crisis, actually the C, the, what we call the CZ region, the Central Eastern and Southeastern European region, was hit worse than many other emerging economies. In this uh, crisis, it seems to us that the region is actually doing better partly because of its um, location in Europe, strong relationships, maybe better health system, also very early reaction to, to contain the spread of the pandemic. So would you share this view that uh, um, among emerging economies, emerging Europe actually is, is faring better this time? Um, so I let my colleague Colette, who's a specialist for the ECA region, for our, what we call the ECA region, I let her answer that question about the SESI countries, but why they hit less, less badly than others. Let me return to your first question. The pandemic is accelerating. Yes, it's accelerating in some EMDEs and some major ones. It's really 
taking off in, Brazil, in Latin America overall, and of course in South Asia, no, India especially. And they couldn't sustain a lockdown. They had to open for a number of reasons. So at this point, the pandemic is proceeding and they're trying to contain it as much as is possible while still allowing some, some gradual opening up. But if you look our at our projections, maybe I should go back to that slide. It's, uh, these regions are very hard hit in our projections. Look at Latin America, for example. We have 7.2% contraction. That is just unheard of for the region. It's extraordinary. And a lot of the region's economies are contracting. That region is hit by more than a pandemic. Yes, the pandemic is currently affecting them. But in addition, they're facing the commodity price shocks. A lot of them are commodity exporters. All of, a lot of them in South America are commodity exporters. They're facing lower commodity prices. A lot of them in Central America and Caribbean are tourist destinations. They're facing a massive tourism shock. So the, 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 Latin America, the Latin America and Caribbean region is facing a whole series of domestic and external shocks. That is a shock that's already baked in our very, I mean, really at this point we think it's realistic. <laughs> But a realistic uh, uh, projection with downside risks and a very muted recovery next year, simply because this is a very severe shock for them. The other region that's hard hit is South Asia. We have to think back of India's growth before in the last, well, in the last 10 years, it was somewhere between 5 and 7%. That's the kind of rate that India was growing at, and India accounts for, for more than 70% of that region's GDP. So this is essentially, uh, to a large degree, a contraction that we're expecting for India, which would be exceptional, really exceptional. So for India, for example, we expect growth to be minus 3%, a little bit worse. So that is, an, it is really an exceptional number. At this point, it's hard to see it getting worse. This is a really severe shock that we do think is adequately reflected in our negative, in our forecast of a projection. So yes, there are downside risks, but I do think that the, what do you call it, the, the most likely scenario is still around our forecast. I don't think they're outdated. So let's do you want to answer on the ECA region. Why is the ECA region doing so well this time around? Didn't in 2009. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me to speak today, everyone. It's a pleasure. Um, so for the ECA region, the reason why it's perceived to be doing a bit better than the global financial crisis. If you recall, back in 2009, uh, we had a severe domestic financial crisis, particularly in Russia. So that's one of um, the unique things. However, I would like to point out that the downgrade to the ECHO region is quite large, um, 7.3 percentage points. Um, this reflects a few things. We First, have oil exporters in the region, so they're dealing with the dual shock from the commodity price shock and the oil prices, as well as uh, the um, public health crisis. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is that for two thirds of the region's economies, the recession they will face this year is expected to be steeper than the global financial crisis. And interestingly, um, many of these are uh, economies that are heavily tied to the um, global value chains into the euro area, such as um, what we call Central Europe. These um, economies may suffer contractions that are as large or larger than the ones that they had faced in the 1990s. Um, so the regional, while the regional aggregate might be a little bit better than um, 2009, this largely reflects the um, large profile of Russia, um, which is the largest economy in the region. Um, so, and then as well, um, we see for the economies that are heavily dependent on tourism, they are facing very steep contractions. For instance, um, Croatia, we have downgraded by 11.9 percentage points and will face the um, sharpest contraction in the region. And that's one of the Central European countries. Um, so there is a, a bit of um, you know, diversity within the region. And that's really the aggregate profile is somewhat masking that. 
I see, let me also add on the, uh, on the global side is policymakers deserve a lot of credit for having taken the financial crisis out of the scenario. You know, usually we worry very much about financial crisis because that's the thing that hurts quickly. But it, with the kind of monetary stimulus and monetary liquidity injections that have been taken, have been done by advanced economy central banks, at the moment the risk of a financial crisis is actually one of the lesser risks. And that benefits the region, which really had a, was hit hard by the financial crisis in 2009. Thank you, Julia. Back to you. Thank you. Back to Martin. Yeah, we uh, got one question, uh, two questions. Actually, one is a technical one. Um, what is the definition of the financial crisis you use? And the second one is a little bit a longer question and actually um, a very interesting one. Um, so basically it says that your uh, presentation is kind of depressing with this uh, outlook. Uh, if we focus on, on GDP growth, but maybe you see also some benefits of the, of the crisis and global coordination. Maybe also some benefits in um, um, uh, regarding to issues related to climate change, something like this, and but also on the on the economic side. So, for example, if um, some countries have um, or had before this crisis high debt levels, now we have to um, introduce fiscal stimulus in a lot of countries. Um, so maybe this is um, this, this this has some some, some benefits for, for those countries that would otherwise um, stick out because of high debt levels. But now, because this is a global phenomenon. Um, uh, maybe these, these countries get some, some, some benefits out of this situation. Yeah, good question. So first, let me just answer the easy one. <laughs> the financial crisis, how do we define financial crisis? You're referring to uh, can't, this. I cannot hear you at the moment. Oh, really? I'm unmuted. Sorry. Now can oh, you hear me? You can hear me. Sorry, it was my mistake. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, so you're referring to this, sorry, not this chart. You're referring to the chart of the, the long-term impact here, the financial crisis. Um, yes, we use the Laban Valencia financial crisis. So that's bank, debt, and currency crisis. And that's why this bar is a little less than that bar, because a lot of the currency crisis, the 30% depreciations that Laban Valencia uses as their definition, a lot of them are not that disruptive, actually. Many of them don't even come with a recession. It's just a, a sort of a cleansing of overvaluation, and then you get a rebound. So that's why these financial crises, per se, if you take all of them together, they don't leave such large damage, simply because I think one third of them, a large number of them, a large share of them, is these currency crises. So that's why we then do the second experiment. What if we just focus on the financial crises that do actually come with recession, that are actually really disruptive? And there we find that the long-term damage is particularly strong. Now, on the second question, the benefits of the crisis. What might be the benefits of the crisis in terms of global coordination? I mean, what the crisis has shown is that really it's difficult for any one country to solve it. No, at this point, it's the global economy that is suffering. And sometimes the, the, one of the benefits is a reminder how much Every country depends on all the others. No urgent global coordination. It's not just on the economic side. Where whether coordinated or not coordinated, all countries have put in place stimulus, including EMDE. Even QE they've done. Now, it may not have been coordinated. It may have been everyone acting in their own self-interest, but by coincidence, it was exactly what the situation needed. And that also comes to your fiscal stimulus. This is what the global economy needed. Everyone was facing the same shock. Everyone took the same policy action. For example, in EMDE, 5.4% of global of EMDE GDP was fiscal stimulus. It's more than twice as much in the global financial crisis. So it has brought home that this is a global problem that needs a global that is better solved with a global solution. Um, now, what are the opportunities? What are some of the other benefits? And one of the benefits that is often mentioned. And maybe my colleague uh, JD can talk a bit more about this. One of the benefits that is mentioned, sort of, or the opportunities that is mentioned when people talk about opportunities created by the crisis, is perhaps the reminder of the fragility of global value chain. Maybe this, there are not just costs to this. Maybe there are even opportunities to this for some countries that are not currently so deeply integrated. 
JD, you've, you've looked at this in more detail. Do you want to answer that? Yes, happy to do so, Francisca. Um, so on this point, I'd say, first, this is a dramatic shock, as we talked about. You know, the, the impact on global output is quite severe, and the impact on global trade will be quite severe. We expect, in fact, we expect the contraction in global trade in 2020 to be larger than that of the global financial crisis, uh, which was extremely large, a so double-digit contraction in trade. Uh, and there's also the the issue that companies will be reassessing their production and value chains um, after this shock. And that's an opportunity, there's a silver lining here for regions that have not had yet had the chance to participate in uh, global value chains, regions such as uh, Black or Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, we have an opportunity to essentially establish a value proposition of diversification for large global companies and say, well, if you move some of your production to another region, you'll benefit from regional and global diversification. Um, so that will require um, substantial amounts of reform in terms of governance, governance uh, good business practices um, to take advantage of those opportunities as they arise. We got an, an, another question looking forward. Um, so what do you think, what are the structural changes uh, in the global economy regarding the supply chain? Um, and which regions could be most prominent? Um, I'll Sorry, can you hear me? There, there are two parts of this question. This is, this is the question that everyone's concerned about. This is a question between today and tomorrow. Uh, so for today, it's hard to see supply chains breaking, simply because there are so many other shocks confounding today's assessment. But tomorrow, JD was already going to that direction. That's, of course, a big risk. So um, if you, if you, it's a big risk and a big opportunity. If you go, um, if you go back to Fukushima, for example, what happened in Japan, when that Fukushima reactor uh, exploded after a tsunami, there was disruption to global supply chain. And it was not such a demand shock, it was truly a global supply chain shock. What you saw after that is diversification away from Japan, but not necessarily back home. It was diversification and not retreat from global value chain. And this is the opportunity that JD mentioned. Perhaps what will happen now is not so, it's hard to see for now, but what might happen going forward is not so much a reshoring, as just a, a diversification in global supply chain. If countries can use that as an opportunity, this might place them well for productivity growth, years of the productivity growth. But of course, there's a reason why currently supply chains are not in these countries. So this is, in a way, it's hard to attract supply chains if you don't offer a nice value proposition. Yeah, this reform, this conducive business climate. It's an opportunity. And Colette, do you have something to add on the ECA region in particular, on the global supply chain? Hi, Francisca. Um, yes, as far as the global value chains, obviously they're very important for the ECA region, um, particularly the backward linkages in Central European countries such as Hungary and Poland, Bulgaria, and their um, participation, especially in um, the automobile um, industry and trade. Um, as far as establishing uh, more connections in that area, there are other parts of the region that could tap into this knowledge and use it to also um, build up their participation in global value chains. Um, as far as um, participating more within the region, um, especially in the eastern parts of the region and Eastern Europe, um, as well as Central Asia, um, as well as, um, you know, kind of uh, progressing on the reforms that I needed to help improve the business climate, which many have um, made some progress in. But back to you. Thank you. Um, we have one more technical question, but it may also evolve in a more <laughs> content-related question. 
So on slide 17, what is the definition of a financial crisis that you use? Oh, that's the love, Valencia. So it includes banking debt and currency crisis. Short answer. Short answer, I hope, also sufficient for the colleague who posted it. And, and another question is, uh, if you think of the very gloomy macroeconomic forecast now, and at the same time, exuberant stock markets, how would you square this puzzle? Yes, that's an interesting juxtaposition, right? Uh, it clearly, stock markets, JD can talk a bit more about this, but uh, clearly stock markets are discounting the present and looking into the recovery. They're a bit ahead of the actual real economy recovery. JD, do you want to expand on that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'd say a few things. First, uh, we know we've seen a big decrease in the discount rate, which you know would naturally tend to raise the value of stock markets. Um, but I think the most important thing this time around is the aggressive policy response that we've seen from central banks. Uh, I think central banks have learned from the, glo the great you know, the global financial crisis 10 years past in terms of going out there and providing all the liquidity that's necessary to support an easing of financial conditions. And that's come at a time, so this is during March, uh, where starting in April and May, we see some glimmers of hope that economic activity can start to recover. And so markets have latched on to that story of improvement on the macro front, um, and then the large amounts of liquidity that's been provided by, finance, by central banks. So the combination of which allows them to price in this very strong V-shaped recovery. So there's definitely downside risks to uh, developments in the market. Uh, in a way, it's a case of everything going right. Uh, and we know that there's a lot of downside risks to the global macro outlook at the moment. So I think we have answered all the questions that came in to the chat. Um, I, I, of course, there is much, much more. <laughs> I, I have one more. Maybe you have a point you would like to raise. Yeah, I, I, there is one more important thing. It came up a bit in one of the uh, questions about this building back to better. Uh, so we've given a lot of praise to policymakers, central banks, governments, for this very urgent, for this big stimulus. And that was right. That, that was exactly the thing to do in the short term, because this is a pressing need. And the lesson learned from 2009. So the urgent has been done very convincingly. And a lot of credit goes to policymakers. The important, as Paul Roma used to separate the urgent from the important, the important has been done a little less actually, because the important over the long run is to create, to generate long run growth momentum. And that is, you know, stimulus can take that over, but really it needs more than stimulus to generate, to stop the expected decline in potential growth that we expect over the next decade. For that, the good policies pre-pandemic are the same right policies post-pandemic, with maybe a few opportunities that allow countries to enter, to use these opportunities. So in some sense, there has been a lot of stimulus, but there hasn't been much done on improving business climate, on, if anything, capital, human capital accumulation is backtracking because of the disruption. Uh, uh, climate change, a lot of countries are now in, expecting to invest in climate change, and that is looking ahead. But this debate is very strong in Europe. It's not everywhere that strong. So this building back to better ha is something that deserves probably another policy push. And not all of that is about money. Some of that is about reforms, you know, regulations, business climate, governance, uh, governance especially, informality. Informality makes everything worse about COVID-19. That needs to be addressed and has long needed to be addressed. Yeah, we got uh, one question regarding the recovery. Shapes, V, W, U, and so on. And um, the question is by how much is this influenced by fiscal measures? You know, 
so yes, so fiscal measures. So we do actually, we run actually the Oxford economics model to estimate the impact of the fiscal measures. And JD was the one who did that. So yes, the policy has of course helped avert the worst in 2020 and it's, it's part of the drive of 21. But the shape of the recovery in some sense doesn't depend on the fiscal measures. It depends on your assumption. So in V, in growth rates we expect the V, in levels we expect the U. It, it, maybe the, maybe the, the, for us the more convenient way of thinking about is what is the contribution of policy to the 2020 collapse and to the recovery in 21. JD, do you want to say a few words? Because you were the one who did these experiments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I'd say is that the, the policy, when we think about it in a macro um, modeling type environment, really shows that it, it's essential in averting and reversing the decline in momentum that we see. So we see the global economy essentially going off a cliff in the second quarter of 2020. Q1 was already very weak with the weakness in China. And you'd expect that momentum, that weakness to carry through, right, large, significant income losses across the world for households, for firms, firms going bankrupt, right? households retrenching on all consumption that's not essential. And so the fiscal response comes in here and not necessarily will help support activity right away, but will cushion income and allow businesses to stay afloat, households to continue meeting their payments, avoid financial crisis. So what the, what the policy response does is really allow for a different trajectory for global growth. So what we see in terms of a model environment is that growth could continue to deteriorate in the second half of 2020, ex any stimulus or any policy. But this cushioning of income, this taking the financial crisis off the table allows for a rebound to begin in the second half of 2020. Uh, so it's quite important. However, that's only useful in the short run. Fiscal responses and monetary responses are not enough to generate large differences in the recovery shape. So in the level sense, moving from a level of U to a level of V approach, uh, the fiscal is not going to be enough. The biggest determinant will be the underlying behavior of the pandemic and, and how much that leaves scarring effects on business and consumer confidence. you. So um, we are almost at the end and uh, of course we have to think um, what happens next and uh, the question just came in asking about the second wave. <laughs> so what would it imply? I think partly you answered it when you talked about the assumptions that are underlying your uh, outlook at the moment. Um, and uh, also it's, it, it is uh, a very <laughs> valid question to ask if lockdowns of the extent seen now would still be feasible. And as you said already before, in some countries, they have not even be feasible in the first place uh, because uh, you, you decide between people starving from not getting the food, like India did, it shut down all the transport, meaning that even food supply didn't reach the people who needed it. Um, but yeah, maybe you want to finish uh, the discussion a little bit about this, uh, hopefully speculation about a second wave. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's exactly our don't fight scenario. So uh, <laughs> to give you a number with all the caveats around the number, our global uh, um, global contraction in 2020 would be 8% instead of 5%. And that is the scenario of the second wave and not a series of lockdowns for three months. Now, I mean, maybe this, what you're arguing is that you can't assume a three month lockdown. So then, because people are just not willing to live with it. But then it would be somewhere between five to eight percent, I guess, if the lockdown is less severe than it has been so far. But that's exactly our downside scenario. What if there is another downturn? Is another lockdown, three months of lockdown? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, to all who joined. Uh, let me also thank. Uh, very much our uh, support in the National Bank, the event management, uh, the IT people. Uh, we could not have done this webinar, and it, I must say it was our first, so I'm very happy it, it went well. Uh, thanks a lot to, to uh, Susie and Andreas and everyone who assisted us here. Uh, thank you to Martin, and thank you in Washington for uh,
giving us this lively and very interesting presentation of the report. Um, we will send the link uh, also um, when we post the, uh, we will first of all post the recording of this uh, discussion and the slides. Uh, Francisca will send us the, the, the final set of slides that we will post on the website and there we will also um, link to the report so that everyone, or I think the link is in your presentation, right? So that everyone can find it easily. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Thanks for the question. And I hope we stay in touch. Uh, this is maybe one of the benefits <laughs> uh, of, of this uh, crisis that we have found out how easy we can also stay in touch and be in contact even without meeting physically. So there is also sort of a good side. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.